Well, Pennington reminded me that uh, not everybody in the audience has written their own C++ compiler. And so when I address a, a non-technical audience, I always try to remember uh, an Abbott and Costello skit where they, uh, Abbott is trying to sell, uh, or yeah, it, it doesn't matter which one. One of them is trying to sell a vacuum cleaner <laughs> to, uh, to a woman. And he knocks on the door, barges into the house, and presents this great vacuum cleaner. And the woman is just totally not interested. And uh, then the other one of them comes in with a sack of cinders and just dumps it right on the rug. And the woman is just mortified. And then he says, but no, I have this great vacuum cleaner. And she she's, doesn't know what this means. And then. Uh, the guy who dumped the cinders grabs the electrical plug and then starts looking around the house. There's no place to plug it in. <laughs> that is, uh, you know, sometimes that's where we are in terms of technology, and I always try to remember that when I'm uh, when I'm addressing a broad audience. Let me uh, give you a little bit of uh, history. Walt well, mentioned in the introduction that I founded the world's first open source company. I bet most people don't know what open source means. It's not that much different than most people didn't know what democracy meant in 1750. In fact, uh, if people, some people are still trying to figure out just what that means. But in 1984, an individual programmer named Richard Stallman created a new movement in terms of creating software. What he had found was that companies trying to prevent the sharing of source code basically made it impossible for programmers to effectively cooperate and collaborate and, and uh, produce efficiently. And so as a single individual, he decided that he would go and create an entirely free software environment in which he could live and into which any programmer would be invited, provided that they followed this rule, which was anybody who read or modified or shared the software that he created was free to do so with only one restriction, that they could not stop anyone else from doing the same thing. From this individual programmer, a movement was born, and today, open source software has become so pervasive that um, uh, it, is, it is being run, it, it, is, it is basically the architecture of the internet. The reason the internet was able to spread so rapidly was because Tim Berners-Lee, when he wrote the World Wide Web application at CERN, wrote it as open source software. And the reason that so many computers were able to talk to each other is because the networking protocol called TCP IP was implemented as open source software. Every person who wanted to plug into the internet could, could get a free web server, could get a free web browser, could get free networking code, and Today, it's even possible to get free operating systems. So what has all this freedom brought? What this freedom has brought is we have now created a global community of software developers who have, for the first time, the ability to truly cooperate on a global basis. And the importance of this is tremendous. Uh, this open source software has made it possible for companies like Google to basically index the entire web and make it possible to run at a far lower cost than ever before uh, a global search engine. It's made it possible to sequence the human genome years ahead of schedule. Three weeks ago in San Diego at the Open Source Conference, um, people who had done that sequencing talked about the fact that open source software made it possible to deploy solutions that were 100 to 1,000 times cheaper than proprietary solutions, and oh, by the way, 10 or 20 times faster to boot. And so uh, in reference to the improvements that one can see in terms of proprietary legacy systems versus open source, we're, it is important to remember that in a lot of these cases, it's not a 10 or 20% or even a 100 or 200% difference. It is um, orders of magnitude. And that's a very important thing to, to acknowledge. Now, in terms of... Um, this open source revolution, which has now become so pervasive that even the world's most powerful monopoly has, has publicly stated that this may be the only thing that they, that, that they will have to compete with because they've killed everybody else. Uh, but uh, when you look at this revolution, I, 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 I do a lot of traveling and I read this book called Founding Brothers, which is about famous people you may have heard of, Washington, Madison, Hamilton, Jefferson, Franklin, 
etc. And it looked at them not from the perspective of being the founding fathers, which is what most people tend to refer them to them, because father sort of implies father knows best, which means they knew what they were doing. And, in, and as this book reveals, they had no idea what they were doing. Not a single one of these guys knew that democracy was going to work. And more to the point, not a single one of these brothers actually agreed with any other brother about what democracy was. And in this incredibly instable environment and amongst a great amount of um, intrigue and creativity and courage and backstabbing, the, um, the founding brothers actually drafted a Declaration of Independence, which uh, could easily be translated to a Declaration of Independence from proprietary software. And they drafted a constitution. And uh, almost immediately, the Constitution, you know, as soon as the Constitution was used, it also became abused. People, uh, because, of the, because of the various wars that were going on, first in Europe and then imported back to the US, the War of 1812, there were all kinds of suspensions of constitutional freedoms because there were terrorists and we needed to protect the security of the state. So as we look at how the world is working today, uh, it's interesting to see how these great lights that we always invoke reacted to very, very similar situations of the time. Now, the reason I bring this up is because looking at how th this book won a Pulitzer Prize, and uh, you know, I think it deserves one, but um, it's a very scholarly work about, uh, you know, the, uh, a good part of this book is actually all the research notes. What's very interesting is it shows in great detail, greater detail than I ever had in high school or college, how a whole bunch of brand new issues came together and what in the creation of government they did about it. Now today, there's a constitutional law professor at Stanford University named Larry Lessig, and he wrote a fantastic book called Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. And fundamentally, his premise is that uh, we have now come to a point in time of technology where the architecture of software is going to define what our laws mean. Just think about that for a second. Right? I, I, I vote, you know, I, 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 I do my civic things, and the thought that some decision that some programmer makes is going to actually control my rights is a scary, scary thought. Unless, of course, it's open source software and I can fix it. But if it's proprietary software and I have no say in who architected that system, when I hear about Malaysia having a national ID card and an e-cash card and a, you know, basically everything about a person and everything that person owns is on one piece of plastic, I have to ask myself the question, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that, you know, has my identity been reduced to a microchip? And um, that's not to say that there can't be ways of making that system work in some sort of effectiveness, but the, the collaboration of technology and law has to be a very tight one. Now, in the, in the world of open source and e-government, one of the things that we're seeing is that in the, in the commercial world, open source technology adaption is happening very, very rapidly. And one of the reasons this is happening very rapidly is because the cycle of rebirth in the corporate world is very, very rapid. Most companies on the Fortune 5, you know, the average lifespan of a Fortune 500 company is not forever. The average lifespan of a Fortune 500 company, I think, last time I checked, was a little bit less than 80 years. Okay, and those are the big ones, right? For many, many businesses, uh, the the companies that I'm affiliated with, Red Hat was founded in 1994. Whatever happened before 1994, you know, we had a clean sheet of paper from which we could build. Uh, our, our IT infrastructure, how we manage our data, all those other things. But in the case of, um, in the case of government, there's a little bit of a longer history. It's a history we're very, very proud of, but it's a history that constrains what we can do. And whereas in the commercial sector, it was just a couple of individuals who rewrote all of Cisco's IT infrastructure and basically put 80% of their e-commerce on the web in less than a year as a voluntary project. Now, in the world of government, unfortunately, no good deed goes unpunished. And, you know, if a couple of guys at the FBI were to display a similar sort of initiative and just say, 
well, if you give me access to this data, I can do that for you. You know, the conversation stops at, if you give me access to this data. <laughs> it is not a conversation that says, that, that, that checks whether or not um, that data can be managed, uh, it can be managed securely, their intentions are good, et cetera, et cetera. And the result is, we do see a lot of legacy systems holding back progress. I think that there is great hope in, um, in what we can do with these systems and what we have seen in many different industries is that when the time comes, when there is a dramatic opportunity to leap forward, those leaps do in fact happen. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, just, I'll just finish up with another little anecdote. I was reading a, a great book. I don't know how many of you guys uh, have time to read books, but uh, I read Seabiscuit. How many people have read Seabiscuit? Wow. <laughs> New York Times number one bestseller this summer. Okay. Uh, We're sea, busy. We're busy. Seabiscuit. In um, if you were to measure the popularity of a subject based on the number of column inches of national press in 1938, the most popular, the fourth most popular guy in the world was Mussolini. The third most popular guy in the world was Hitler. The second most popular guy in the world was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the number one most popular subject was a horse named Seabiscuit. This is a story of how did this horse become a national obsession. And the story begins with Charles Howard, who had the whole West Coast franchise for General Motors. And he came to San Francisco with 22 cents in his pocket to basically go and start selling automobiles. There's just one problem. Automobiles were all but illegal in California, and particularly in San Francisco. For three years, the three cars he had in his showroom sat unused. California didn't want this technology. It had the best horses and the best riders and everything else was really geared toward the horse. And no matter what this guy did, nobody, but nobody wanted to buy his cars. To make ends meet, he had to help people repair bicycles in his, you know, when he wasn't not selling his cars. That all changed in 1906. There was an earthquake, and all of a sudden, he had the only three ambulances in the city of San Francisco. And so successfully were these cars used because of that disruptive event that he became so wealthy that when General Motors fell on hard times, he personally bailed them out with a $200,000 loan. So, I think that when we look at technology and the power and the opportunity of great disruptions, e-government e is not going to happen when somebody shows a 20% or a 40% or a 100% better mousetrap. E-business and e-government happen when somebody can say, I can do it 100 times better at 1 100th the cost and I can solve all these security problems. But to do that, we have to go back and we have to understand what are the laws that we want to build? What are the technologies that we want to implement? And what are the people we want to serve? And I am sure that we will, if we haven't already, you know, started to hit those earthquakes that are going to make e-government go from something that just sits behind a store window unused for two or three years to something which becomes you know, the very fabric of our existence. Thanks.